All right, this is a meeting of the Advisory Council on Workers' Compensation on Monday, April 3, 2017, at approximately 1.10, 1.15 p.m., Legislative Plaza Room 16. I'm David Lillard, Tennessee State Treasurer and Chair of the Council, and I call this Council meeting to order. As I announced just a minute ago, at and <coughs> systems are down and our Treasury Department bridge line and other bridge lines are not working today. So what we've done is gotten Brian Hunt, who's a voting member of the council, who's not physically present, on a cell phone here. Unfortunately, we don't have the capacity to accommodate other non-voting members of the council who may be trying to call in. So we're going to have to try to proceed with this in, in that manner. Um, and we, and I, the chair will note, we seem to have a physical quorum present anyway. So, um, Ms. Allen, do you have any advice about that? Okay. All right, then, um, Mr. Scroggs, I'll ask you to call the roll. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Dove, Mr. Fox, Here. Mr. Garrett, Here. Mr. Hunt, we know, and Mr. Pitts, Here. and Mr. Schaefer is away, so we have a physical quorum. We also uh, want to call, I'm not sure anybody <laughs> can, uh, can answer for some of these, obviously, but we do have Jason Denton. We have uh, Dr. Keith Graves. Uh, and then the other, the other members who are probably trying to call in include Pam Smith. We have Greg Ramos here. here. Sam, uh, Dr. Merle is probably trying to call in. Mr. Mayo. He, he, okay. Uh, Mr. Mayo, Ms. Lawyer, Mr. Harris. Um, Mr. Burleson and Ms. Fletchall. So those are not able to call in or are not here, but we do have a physical quorum, Mr. Chairman. Okay, very good. Um, this first item for our agenda today is item number three, approval of the minutes of the Advisory Council's meeting from March 20, 2017. Are there any comments or questions about the minutes? Seeing none, um, is there a motion to approve the minutes? All right, we have a motion by Mr. Kerry Dove. Is there a second? Second. All right, a second by Mr. Fox. All right, would you call the roll on the motion to approve the minutes? On the motion, uh, Mr. Dove, Mr. Fox, Mr. Garrett, Mr. Hunt. Aye. Mr. Pitts. Here. And Chairman Lillard. Aye. Okay, motion carries. All right, the minutes are adopted. All right, we'll go to new business, which is item four on the council's agenda, which is consideration and recommendations on proposed legislation affecting the Tennessee workers' compensation system as introduced in the first session of the 110th General Assembly. First bill today is House Bill 0666, Senate Bill 0297, by Representative Hill and Senator Briggs. Senator Briggs, you're recognized on your bill. Can you hear me? Yeah, we, we got it now. They had it hidden underneath. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, Senate Bill 297 uh, began after my office received several constituent cases dealing with the present workers' compensation system. I have an amendment that makes the bill, so I request a motion on the amendment to have it properly before the committee. All right. Do we... Um I believe this is Amendment 006753 is the most recent amendment. Mm -hmm. Is that the one you got in the packet, Larry? That's all we need. That's all. Is that what you needed? You have that in your agenda, too. Zero, six, yeah. zero, zero, six, five, seven, six. Is that, that's the previous one. That's the previous one. All right. Six, seven, five, three. Yeah. Five, three. Okay, I see you're referring. All right. Nope, nope that's, still that's not it. it. Copies, but 
Okay. All right. Here's two copies. That's an extra one there. All right. Senator Briggs, we have 006753, correct? Uh, yes, sir, that's okay. correct. All right. All right. Let's see here now. All right. Would you, uh, our procedure is a little different here in the council than standing committees of the legislature. If you're just going to give us the introduction of your amendment and the bill, okay. Okay. And that, that'll suffice at this moment, okay? Okay, this amendment rewrites the bill to address three concerns with our workers' compensation law. This amendment is a compromise between employers and the employees. Section 1 deals with utilization review. The utilization review shall not apply to diagnostic procedures in the first 30 days after the date of injury. It also says that utilization review shall not apply to diagnostic studies recommended by the treating physician in the event the initial treatment is not successful in returning the person to work. This section helps both the employee and the adjuster. Section 2 addresses the problem that arises when the employer provides a panel of doctors to an employee in which all the doctors are in the same practice group. This section requires that two or the three panel physicians not be in the same practice. And then section three uh, simply increases the funeral benefit from $7,500 to $10,000 because the law has not been changed in decades and the cost to bury someone now is higher than $7,500. And it's my understanding that all the parties have agreed to this compromise language and uh, I'm available for any questions. All right, any questions to Senator Briggs about the bill or the amendment that he proffers on that? Mr. Dove, you're recognized. Thank you. Um, I do have a question about Section 1B, where diagnostic studies recommended by the treating physician in the event of the initial treatment regimen is not successful in returning the injured employee to work. I needed some clarification on that um, and had some concerns regarding that, so I, I did talk to Dr. Snyder, and he explained to me what the intent of this was. Uh, my, my main concern was if an employee or a patient had initial diagnosis uh, based upon imaging uh, initially and uh, went through surgical procedures, and uh, after that, uh, did not progress the way they should be, what, what would be the use of additional imaging? Uh, and and uh, uh, when I discussed that with, with Dr. Snyder, he said that was not the intent of this. This section, the intent was for treatment to be performed without or uh, imaging, non-surgical treatment without imaging, and then after that initial, initial regimen, if it was not successful, then uh, obtaining a diagnosis based on that imaging uh, to go forward. Uh, and I agree with that. That's, I think that's the way it should be. But that's not the way that this reads uh, to me. So I think we need to clean that up a little bit. And Dr. Snyder, if you want to kind of uh, clarify that a little bit for the council, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Briggs. Thank you, committee. Um, what we had uh, agreed to or what uh, we had discussed was the event where the initial treatment had been non-surgical and where no uh, initial diagnostic studies or procedures, uh, initial diagnostic studies had occurred. And so it would then read, in the event the initial treatment regimen and then parenthesis, non-surgical without diagnostic and without diagnostic studies, end of parenthesis, is not successful. That would be, that would be under uh, the second paragraph, under um, second line, second paragraph. So. Tell me exactly again, Dr. Snyder, where we're inserting that. Okay, it's in the second paragraph where it says, the system of utilization review shall not apply to diagnostic studies recommended by the treating physician in the event the initial treatment regimen, parenthesis, non-surgical without diagnostic studies, end of parenthesis, is not successful in returning an injured uh, 
worker to em employment. All right, are there further questions or discussion? Yes, sir. Mr. Gray. I just want to clarify diagnostic procedures it uh, does not include routine x-rays is that accurate plain film x-rays it does include it does include plain film x-rays right diagnostic procedures mean the following but not but not limited to routine and specialty radiography mri except mri for low back pain without radiculopathy CT, myelogram, arthrograms, ultrasound, or EMG and NCV. Okay, thank you. Okay, we're in discussion on this bill and questions of Senator Briggs and uh, Dr. Snyder too, but does anyone have any questions or discussion on this matter? If we're just clarifying the language, it's Mr. Bruce to, Fox speaking. To include non-surgical. Non yes. Then everything else in the in the section would remain the same. Correct. Okay. I think we could live with that. <laughs> okay. Mr. Pitts is recognized. Mr. Chairman, could we ask the sponsor if he's comfortable with this suggestion by the doctor? It seems to be working well up here. <laughs> you know, I looked at some of my subject matter experts that's uh, sitting up here and, uh, and to our doctor here. If that's, I mean, it's, it's okay with me. I mean, uh, and I see, uh, I see Mr. Fox shaking his head, and I think if it's uh, okay with some of the, uh, the experts on this, that would be okay with me. My second question would be, does the note taker have the dictation sufficient that we could insert that in the minutes of this meeting? We're going to have the doctor read it again here in just a second, but okay. I want to make sure we get any further discussion in here. Okay. Anything and everybody's got I'm ready to it. make a motion or defer, right. whichever you want. Okay. Doctor, if you'd read that language again uh, in reference, it's point of insert uh, in, the, in the drafting code 006753, okay? Second paragraph, starting with the system of utilization review shall not apply to diagnostic studies recommended by the treating physician in the event the initial treatment regimen, parenthesis, non-surgical without diagnostic studies, end of parenthesis, and then the rest of the sentence is the same, is not successful in returning the injured worker to employment. So you're amending subsection, section one, um, uh, J, I guess it is, yeah, J, it looks like, and capital B, right, is where you're inserting that, correct? I'm, I'm sorry, but I don't have the, the copy that you guys, <laughs> that you gentlemen have. We're looking at, okay, because okay. we've got to reference the yeah. drafting code section. Yeah. Yes, it would be in that sec that uh, B okay. second that line. Be there. Okay. So read it one more time for us. Write this down. He's adding words to the front of it there. Diagnostic studies recommended by the treating physician in the event the initial treatment regimen, parenthesis, non-surgical without diagnostic procedures, end of parenthesis, is not successful in returning the injured worker to employment. Okay, is there, seeing no further discussion or questions, is there a motion with respect to the bill? Uh, I assume with the amendment that the doctor has, has uh, read into the record here, which is an amendment to 006753, that drafting code. Mr. Pitts, you recognize? Mr. Chairman, unless there's objection, uh, I would move that uh, the advisory council go on record in support of this bill as amended in this meeting. All right, and clarifying for the record, meaning the bill is originally proffered by Dr. Briggs, HB 0666, Senate Bill 0297, 
and his amendment that Senator Briggs uh, in indicated earlier, which is drafting code 006753 and the further amendatory language that Dr. Snyder read into the record. So we have a motion to adopt that or rather to recommend that for passage. Mr. Chairman, I said all that. You just missed it. <laughs> all right. Just to make real clear what we're doing here. All right. So we have a motion. Is there a second to the motion? Second. Second by Mr. Fox. Any further discussion? Yes, sir. Chairman Eldridge is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, Dr. Briggs, uh, Senator. Uh, uh, can you just have it re redrafted before it comes to committee? Just ha uh, but before which committee? I mean, you mean the, um, the, the before House uh, and the Senate committees? Right. Um, I, I think that will be. Assume I, it may be a problem because we're on the final calendar on the. Oh uh, yeah. Okay. We hadn't heard the bill in the. Uh, yeah, they're meeting right now on the final calendar. Well, okay, that's that's fine. We're all right. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, if there's no further discussion or questions, I'll ask Mr. Scroggs to call the roll on the motion. Mr. Dove. Aye. Mr. Fox. Mr. Garrett. Aye. Mr. Hunt. Aye. Mr. Pitts. All members voting All right. present. It's unanimous for the, among the voting members, and the bill is recommended for passage as indicated. Thank you, Dr. Bird. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and committee members. All right, the next item is House Bill 0939, Senate Bill 0261 by Chairman Carter and Chairman Johnson. Chairman Carter, you want to come forward? and uh, either Either way, whichever one you'd like. I get to see people sitting here through the week, so I'd like to see what it feels okay. like. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm here to be happy to answer any questions or take any advice or any comments from the group that uh, you feel are appropriate. Okay. So the chairman proposes this bill as tendered to the council previously? Yes. All right. Any discussion or questions on the bill of Chairman Carter or others? Mr. Chairman, I wanted to make sure nobody else has any comments. I'm going to make a motion that I may need help from you all in getting it down correctly. Uh, there, there are sort of two parts to this. Uh, it would be that we're in support of the part one section of the bill. We do not concur with the second part of the bill, which is the part about the Supreme Court having the option to take a transmittal of a workers' comp case. Uh, when y'all get that your, sort of... Your intention by intending to make a motion to that effect is that you are recommending for passage the portions of the bill that that do not deal with the issue of direct appeals to the Supreme Court in workers' comp cases, right? That is correct. And, all right, there, there are several issues raised by that. One is, I don't know that... Um, that we have ever divided a bill as such. You know, we have we have proffered amendments to bills or recommended amendments to bills, but I don't know that we've ever said we agree with this particular part of the bill and we disagree with that particular part of the bill. Um, that's a historical thing, I guess, as much as anything. But it's Mr. Chairman, if you're comfortable with that, I'm prepared to go a different direction. Just tell you what part we're not ready to go with. I'm asking, uh, I'm asking voting members of the council to uh, give me their thoughts on this as well. Um, you know, as, as a matter of form, what we have done in the past is just say that 
that we recommend a bill, uh, for instance, and that uh, we recommend also that it have an amendment attached to it that deletes Section X, you know, or Section Y, um, so as to indicate um, support for portions of the bill but not for the entire bill under those circumstances. And I guess the other question I have is whether you're uh, dealing with the that section that you wish to delete is simply saying it goes forward with no recommendation or does it go forward with a negative recommendation? Mr. Chairman, trying to honor your thoughts and past history of the council, I am willing to do whatever is required to allow the bill to move forward with the uh, with recommendation, with the exception of the part dealing uh, with an option to the Supreme Court as to whether it takes a case or not. Now, um, that can be in the form of that that provision of proposal be deleted. And then I want to make a comment for the record as to why I'm offering that at the appropriate time. All right, first I'll ask if there are any, any uh, comments or questions, et cetera, on Mr. Pitts's uh, motion that he has made, um, and is there a second for his motion with the understanding that uh, what it means is that, as he said, that all portions of the bill other than um, that part which deals with the direct appeals to the Supreme Court receive the recommendation of the council, and that in that process, the council recommends an amendment deleting the provision dealing with direct appeals or provisions that deal with direct appeals to the Supreme Court, in other words, preserving current law on that. And in this matter, I'll point out for the record, for those who may be watching the tape, I know voting members know this, the chair does not have a vote under the statute on matters dealing with substantive motions for or against legislation. The chair only votes on procedural or administrative matters, so I'll just note that. Uh, for the record here. Okay. Any discussion on Mr. Pitts's motion or a second for it? Chairman Eldridge, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Pitts, are you talking about on Section 2, taking it, just taking out Part D? Totally. Just make sure we're all. I believe that would just be Section D. Am I right, attorneys? Right. That's what we believe it is. Yeah. Okay. Just want to make sure. Right. I'm with you. If I could just comment, our, our concern is if that were to pass, the employees would lose their right to appeal, as I understand it. There would, there would be no way for an employee to appeal uh, if that's removed, and that, that's what our primary concern well, but I don't, is. I don't think that, let me say, I don't think that's the case. They would still have an appeal to the Tennessee Court of Appeals, correct? I mean, they would ultimately, or to the workers' the comp board. panel, to the board. Yeah. Yeah. Let me tell you what it does. Right. They lose if the appeal of right to the Supreme Court. We get no absolute guarantee of an appeal. It becomes subjective decision of the court. Yeah, that's right. I'm sorry I made a mistake on that. You're right. Mr. Denton, yes, please. Uh, just for clarification for the record, it's just not the employee, it's the employer's uh, right of appeal. It's both sides. Mr. Chairman? Yes. 
For the record, I would like to insert some remarks that go something like this. This is an issue of significant importance, in my opinion, to both the employer and employee community. The way the present law is, is the way the law has been during reform. Uh, under our system, there is no appeal to the Court of Appeals. And with the administrative system, the business and employee community believe it's crucially important to keep the right of direct appeal to the Supreme Court guaranteed. As I stated at our last meeting, very small number of these cases ever get to the court. I suspect there's going to be even less. It is not a workload issue. It's a philosophical issue. Thank you, sir. All right. Okay, so as I understand it, the motion that we have on the table now, which has not been seconded at this point, but we have a motion by Mr. Pitts to report out the, the bill uh, as a whole with an amendment that deletes section 2D of drafting code 002469, excuse me, that's the bill number, um, Senate Bill 261, and we need a second on that motion. A second. All right, we have a second. Are there any further comments or discussion on the proposed legislation? All right, Mr. Scroggs, would you call the roll of the voting members on the motion? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Dove, yes. Mr. Fox, no. Mr. Garrett, no, no. Mr. Hunt, aye, Mr. Pitts, aye. three eyes, two noes. So. Three eyes, two noes, right? But Okay, having received a majority of the voting members of the council, the bill is reported out in accordance with the motion. All right, thank you very much, Chairman Carter. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, next item is item B, 4B on our agenda, presentation of draft revision of the medical fee schedule by Abby Hudgens, administrator of the Bureau's, Bureau of Workers' Compensation. Ms. Hudgens, you're recognized. Thank you, Chairman Lillard. Um, last time at the last meeting, we gave a presentation and handed out three packets of um, the new uh, rules that we propose for uh, medical issues, medical payments, and there was a lot of conversation, there was a lot of information, and during that, uh, we were asked, would we allow everyone a chance to look at it and uh, to come back and talk about it again. In addition, there was uh, a comment made by Mr. Fox that his concern was utilization review, and we did look at that, and that what is what led to uh, the amendment in House Bill 666. Uh, but we've not really made any changes to the fee schedule. What we hope we have done is given you all some more information, and we're here today to give you additional information in a little bit different way. So I just want to go over, the purpose is the same as it was last time, which is that it's comprehensive in scope and it leads to good medical practice and as reasonable cost as possible. What we gave you last week were three different sets of rules. One is, and you'll see on uh, what we handed out, was rule 0800, dash 02 dash 17 which is medical payments and those are for payments for doctors uh, anything that's not inpatient then rule 18 was the medical fee schedule which is outpatient surgery and then rule 19 which is inpatient surgery just wanted to go over a couple of the things that were in each one of those 
just to sort of clarify and, and put everything in sort of nice, neat little boxes. In the Rule 17, uh, changes to the fee rules for medical payments, we have uh, modified the definitions. The reason was to simplify the use we found that what would work best for most people is that we use the Medicare rules that were in effect on the date of service. And for the people that use the fee schedules, this would be very helpful and cut down on confusion and friction points, which is one of our goals. We also, as we mentioned last time, added language for something that's brand new, which is e-billing. Then there was some question, and I said it wrong, and Dr. Snyder corrected me. Uh, about the new codes for extra time for discussion with an injured worker or case manager, uh, a new code for assessment, counseling, or behavioral intervention for substance or alcohol use, and have given the actual CPT codes. And the reason that these were important is over the last two years, we tried to look at those parts of the fee schedule did not, that did not meet the needs of workers' compensation. So if you're trying to get someone off of opioid use, you need to be able to have counseling. Uh, if you are asking a doctor to provide a causation opinion or spend extra time with a case manager, you need to have a way so that the doctor is compensated. There's another CPT code for the subsequent review of causation that I mentioned. And the same rationale fits here as well. This is to make the fee schedule work best for the workers' compensation uh, system in general. There is a new provision. Uh, just wanted to go over that again. And this has to do with avoiding delay in treatment unnecessarily. And that is, if a request for authorization for treatment is made more than 21 days before the date of treatment, for example, more than 21 days before surgery, is scheduled and the payor has not responded by seven days before the treatment, then it may be a pr presumed that it is approved. This prevents a utilization review company from holding up a process unnecessarily and it's just a matter of fairness. Then we go to the next set of rules which are outpatient services and those are primarily clarifying language. Uh, that you can see on the PowerPoint slide. What we've done is what I said we did on some of the other areas. We've just tried to clarify the rules so that it makes uh, sense and is less prone to be misinterpreted. Then I wanted to clarify too, uh, when we talked about the change in utilization review for uh, physical therapy and outpatient therapy. We didn't do away with UR after 12 visits. We just made it permissive rather than mandatory. So an employer that still wants to do that can, but if an employer is or a payer is willing uh, to go forward, then they're not bound by the rules. Then the last change uh, set of rules is 0800-02-19, and that's the one we talked about a good bit last week, which is the revenue neutral change in hospital payments. And we made raise some and lowered the others. The whole idea was to eliminate a confusion when our medical payment committee meets. There often is a lot of confusion uh, and a lot of disputes about what constitutes a level one trauma visit, when the level one trauma fees stop, or are they there for the entire hospitalization? And we've tried to address that in a positive way. Then I just wanted to go over quickly, the rulemaking process is, as for all rules, is fairly long. And I just wanted to let you know how it works for uh, rules involving um, our fee schedule. And that is we start with you all, consultation with the advisory committee. We also consult with the Medical Advisory Committee and Medical Payment Committee. Both of those committees are established by statute as an important part of the medical program. Then we go to a notice to the general public, uh, which has to be put out there uh, 
not less than 50 days before a hearing. We have a hearing. We listen to input from anyone who has a comment on the rules. Then we spend as long as it takes. It depends on how many comments are made. We spend an extensive time going over each and every comment. We discuss it in the Bureau. We determine whether someone, in fact, as they could very well do, have a better idea if there are changes to be made. We make those changes. Then we send it to the Attorney General, and typically the Attorney General has a few changes to make as well. The final version is sent to the Secretary of State. Then we go to Government Ops, and then if, after Government Ops Committee, the rules will go into effect 90 days after they filed with the Secretary of State. All this is to say uh, we're probably looking at about nine months before these rules go into effect. Now that's just to give you an overview. Um, I've, I've got the real source of information with me, which is Dr. Snyder. If you have questions about the details of the fee schedule, he's here and he's certainly glad to respond. Okay, any questions of Ms. Uh, Hudgens or Dr. Snyder in regard to this matter? Yes, Mr. Denton's recognized. I think I brought this up last time. Under CPT code 99358-9, the one that's being added for subsequent review of causation, is that going to be a billable code at the request of either the employee or the employer, or is that just at the request of the employer? At the request of the physician. Now, the, what, has to, what has to occur is that the physician has to have been presented with significantly new information by the adjuster and a question concerning causation before they can bill that. It would have to be new information. From the adjuster only? From, well, no, from, from it could be from the case manager, could be from the employer. Or the employee? Or the employee. Are there any further questions or comments by members of the council? Okay. Uh, this is before us for comments from the department, so are there any formal comments that this body has which it wishes to adopt by motion, or there's no requirement that we have a comment? An ADA folks would be nice. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Mr. Pitts is recognized. I would make a motion that the advisory council looks with favor on the presentation that has been made and full support. Okay. So, so the chair interprets that to mean that the council is recommending adoption of this rule. Okay. All right. So motion is to, that the council recommends adoption of the rule as proposed. All right, and we have a motion by Mr. Pitts and Mr. Garrett second, is that right? Yeah, okay, he seconded. So uh, is there any further discussion on this? If not, Mr. Scroggs, do you call the roll of the voting members on the motion? Mr. Dove, Mr. Fox, temporarily away, Mr. Garrett, Aye. Mr. Hunt, Aye. Mr. Pitts, Aye. and we have four with out Mr. Fox, who probably okay. will be back, and we'll make sure to All make right. sure about it. And for the record, Mr. Hunt voted aye here. Okay. All right. So having received a majority, the uh, matter goes out with a favorable recommendation for adoption from the council. Thank you very much, Ms. Hudgens and Dr. Snyder. I would just like to say one thing, uh, and that is just to point out to everyone that there will be a public hearing, and you have all the rules in front of you. Should you have additional questions or comments you want to make at that time, we certainly will welcome those. Okay, thank you, Ms. Hudgens, and thank you, Dr. Snyder. All right, that brings to the end of our regular agenda here today. Is there any further business to come before the advisory council at this point? The chair will note Mr. Scroggs advises there are no further bills pending action at this point in the legislative session. Of course, we could have a, a meeting by call of the chair if necessary, if that becomes uh, necessary because of a late referral or something. But without that, it would seem this would be our last meeting of this particular legislative session. Of course, we'll have meetings subsequent for other reasons. But all right, any further business? 
All right, seeing none, Chair, we'd entertain a motion to adjourn. We have a motion by Mr. Pitts. Second. Second by Mr. Garrett. All right, without objection, Commission Council will stand adjourned. Thank you very much and appreciate your service to the state of Tennessee. Mr. Hunt, thank you for being on the phone.